I just want to start by uh, welcoming you all to the Australian Institute of, of Criminology. It's, uh, it's really a, a great pleasure to have uh, you folks here uh, from the uh, Australian Institute of uh, Professional Intelligence Officers and uh, I really do hope that this could be the start of a uh, fruitful collaboration in, in future with, uh, with your institute. Um, the presentation I'm going to give today is actually based on uh, pretty much the last piece of research that I undertook uh, back in the UK when I was run running a, a consultancy and it was really the last of a string of, of uh, evaluations that I undertook for the Home Office around different aspects of, of organised crime uh, and the, the results of this work were published uh, last September, September just gone uh, and are available uh, on the Home Office website that I'll, I'll give details to at the end. What I'm start by doing is really just, just talking a bit about the the, the, the context uh, and the climate for financial investigation uh, in the UK. And it really is a story of um, a tremendous effort that the, the UK government and law enforcement agencies uh, put into making uh, financial investigation and proceeds of crime, uh, asset recovery processes a success uh, over uh, the uh, preceding 10 years. And it really started with uh, legislation that came in around the same time as it, it did in uh, Australia around uh, proceeds of crime, uh, which introduced a regime of, of asset recovery, including uh, cash seizures, cash forfeiture, uh, restraint of assets, confiscation orders, and civil recovery of assets, in many respects similar to the, the Australian uh, legislation. And it's fair to say that most of the effort has really focused on the, uh, the, the role of asset recovery. Uh, in terms of doing financial investigation to get to bring the money in. Uh, really seeing asset recovery as an important um, tool in tackling organised crime uh, with the kind of mantra of you know, re re removing the, the profits from crime. And, and what, we, what we've seen is, uh, is a number of different uh, uh, initiatives that have been, been undertaken during that period. Uh, one of, the, one of the first that came out of the, the legislation was the, uh, the formation of an asset recovery agency that focused on um, asset recovery uh, cases. Uh, we, that was subsequently merged into the Serious Organised Crime Agency following uh, reviews uh, in the mid-2000s mid and uh, questions about the successes. There were, there were issues about the extent to which it was actually bringing in assets as opposed to the, the costs associated with the, with the agency. But for me, actually, one of the, the, the prime movers for the rise of asset recovery and particularly financial investigation was really the uh, Asset recover, Recovery Incentivization Scheme, which uh, basically uh, allowed for 50% of the, the assets recovered, the profits from the assets recovered, to be returned to the law enforcement efforts to tackle uh, subsequent organized crime. Uh, and the way that's, that's divided up is that 18.75% um, of assets go back to the investigating authority. 18.75% uh, uh, of assets go back to the prosecuting agency, typically the Crown Prosecution Service, and 12.5% go back to the um, enforcement agency, so the agency that's uh, tasked with recovering the actual assets in which is usually Her Majesty's uh, court service that recovers those assets. And so that actually creates a, a virtuous cycle because as a result of undertaking um, an operation resulting in recovery of assets, it means that some of that, those, uh, the, the results of those assets can be reinvested back into to law enforcement activity. And what's been particularly um, beneficial from that is just the, the huge rise in and professionalisation of uh, financial investigators in the UK. So back in uh, 2004 there were 321 uh, accredited financial investigators in the UK. By 2011 there were 2,666. So just a massive increase in investment in financial investigation, uh, particularly targeting organised crime cases. Uh, other work that uh, 
was developed uh, during the, the, the 2000s included the development of a, a network of uh, regional asset recovery teams. Uh, so uh, across the 50-odd uh, police forces uh, in the uh, UK, uh, there were, um, I think it's now six regions with uh, asset recovery uh, task forces uh, that, that particularly look at cross-border cases uh, where the, uh, the, the team focus on uh, regional cases that, that may well affect more than one uh, area. Uh, in those cases, the, the assets return back to the home, uh, home force, uh, allowing uh, for kind of additional work to be, to be undertaken at the local area. Um, as a, uh, so th that's, if you like, on the, the, the carrot uh, side of things, but there are a number of sticks that were also introduced along with the legislation and the, uh, the asset uh, incentivization scheme. So there was a, there was a national target that was, was introduced uh, with an aim to recover 250 million by April 2010. Um, it was actually scrapped when the new uh, coalition government uh, came in, uh, but it, it was pretty much nowhere near meeting that, that target at the time. Um, there were also a string of reviews that were undertaken uh, during uh, the period uh, from uh, 2004 to, to 2010, really identifying ways in which uh, financial investigation could be improved to increase the, the levels of, of uh, assets that were, were being recovered from the, uh, from the scheme. And in addition, there were, there were two, two unpublished reviews that were undertaken for uh, Prime Minister's delivery unit that were concerned with the, the amount of assets that were actually being, being recovered. And I'll touch on some issues around uh, asset recovery that, that still exists in, in the UK. But what I'll be particularly focusing on is the, if not the benefits of the, the financial investigation work itself. Uh, and particularly talking about this, uh, this study that uh, I was in, involved with in the UK. So the aim of the study was to investigate the contribution of financial investigation and asset recovery to tackling organized crime. Now, as I said, most of the effort up to now had been on understanding uh, the asset recovery end. How do you get more money back from uh, organized crime groups in particular? This study was slightly different. It had that aspect to some degree, but it was particularly focused on the investigation process. So how could financial investigation be used throughout the investigation process to uh, improve detections and, and improve uh, the way in which the investigation process worked? Now, before I go further, it's, I just want to acknowledge that this wasn't a sole effort. It was uh, it's quite a significant study, and uh, actually there were eight of us that uh, were involved in, uh, in this particular uh, piece of work, uh, and it's to their credit that uh, it came off so well. So, in terms of methodology, there were three main stages. Uh, the first stage was the development work, which was about understanding what were the issues around financial investigation. Uh, and that involved uh, two workshops with financial investigators, uh, one held in London, one in Manchester, um, to unpack the, really, the issues, what are the questions that we should be asking when we, uh, we move into to the main study. So it was, the, uh, the research was, was largely driven from, from the ground, from the financial investigators, identifying the key themes really that we should be uh, exploring in further detail uh, down the line. Then we moved on to the, the main study, which was uh, an uh, individual face-to-face uh, -face, uh, interview-based study uh, using uh, qualitative uh, interviewing, uh, focused on interviews with, with operational staff. The, uh, the, the study consisted of targeting 60 cases uh, in which uh, financial investigation had resulted in a uh, confiscation order. Uh, and so there's, there's a slight uh, bias in our sample because we're, we, our 60 <coughs> cases consist of, in a sense, successes. They've all resulted in a confiscation order. What we didn't look at were financial investigations that failed along the way and didn't end up in some sort of uh, asset recovery at the end of the process. So, so just bear that in mind that this kind of may, may present a bit of a rosy glow because in a sense, it's those which, which, where it's worked. And so, so keep that in mind. Um, UK has a, uh, a database called the Joint Asset Recovery Database that, that uh, records details of all um, asset recovery cases. 
And so financial investigators should really re be recording at an early stage when they start an investigation on that database. And then it will track the case through to um, the award of a confiscation order, and then they track it through to uh, the, uh, the repayment of, of the confiscation funds to the, the, um, the, the assets. So you get quite a good picture of, uh, of, the, um, of the cases involved. Um, interestingly, when we looked at the database, uh, it was uh, missing cases from West Midlands, which is the second largest uh, police force in England and Wales, uh, and um, certainly has the kind of second largest uh, operational uh, input into tackling uh, organised crime. So um, we're not sure why that was missing, but we had to then uh, go to the police force specifically and ask for uh, their quota of, of cases to make up the 60. So six cases from West Midlands uh, to make up our sample. We chose cases from the database that um, involved the recovery of assets worth, uh, or a benefit figure, I should say, uh, involved in the, uh, in the cases of in excess of £100,000. Uh, basically because we wanted to uh, try and just, just uh, filter out those cases which are more likely to be organised crime cases. And we took the line that that 100000 threshold was a, was a starting point for cases which were more likely to be at the, the organised end. Um, on that database, there are 153 cases with a, with a benefit value in excess of 100,000, and so our sample accounted for about 35% of those on the database. The cases came from five uh, regional asset recovery teams. Uh, at the time, there were only five, so we, we managed to cover all of those. Uh, they came from seven of the nine uh, units that were run by Her Majesty's uh, Revenue and Customs, so uh, particularly based around uh, uh, VAT and, um, and tax cases. Uh, and in addition, there were uh, 20 of the 27 police forces that were on the database uh, covered by the, by the research. Once we'd selected the initial sample, we uh, contacted all the, the uh, investigating team involved in each of the 60 cases and asked them to complete a questionnaire, uh, principally to find out whether that case really was an organised crime case. So we gathered some basic information. From that, there were a small number of cases that we, uh, we took weren't uh, organised crime cases, and so we resampled from JAR to, to uh, create the sample from within those, those police forces. And the idea for each of those 60 cases was to interview uh, the uh, individuals involved in the case, three individuals, the, uh, the financial investigator, the uh, investigating officer, and uh, the prosecutor involved in the case. So the idea was to try and get uh, a degree of, of triangulation. So, um, so we wouldn't take any one person's word for, the, uh, for, for what they were seeing as, as working well or not working well on a particular case. It was a case of trying to take a balanced view uh, across the case. And, uh, uh, so in, in theory, that would end up with 180 uh, interviews, um, which, as, I, as I'll come on to in a moment, we, we didn't quite reach, but we did pretty well. The, the other thing just to, to highlight from this is that we took a conscious decision that to focus on particular cases, uh, because what we were concerned about was that if we, uh, if we talked to financial investigators and, invest and investigate officers about cases in general, uh, about how financial investigation is used, we would end up with basically talking in general generalities, uh, and you'd end up with only the most salient issues coming out, and all the things that were uh, particularly extreme. So you wouldn't really get uh, a, a really balanced view of, of how financial investigation is working. So it was actually quite important that we took a, a case-specific uh, focus uh, on, on the work. And typically in the interviews, you'd have um, cases where uh, the investigating officers would be surprised why we've chosen this particular case as, as opposed to any other, and they were really they were selected at random, uh, and really they wanted to talk about more interesting cases, and we had to kind of keep bringing them back to talk about these particular cases. Um, the, in addition to the, the, the main study, we also realised that there were a number of issues that, that existed around the, uh, the confiscation order process and the actual process of recovering the assets. So we undertook eight additional interviews that were more in the general uh, frame rather than case specific. Uh, and they were just aimed at um, really 
getting a better understanding of what were these issues that the uh, investigating officers and the financial investigators were telling us were happening at the confiscation order process to, uh, and, and where were the blockages that we could then report back uh, to the Home Office. So that gives, us, gives you an idea of, of, of uh, where we aim to go. And this just uh, shows you the, the achieved sample. So the, um, the potential sample was, uh, was 180 uh, uh, interviews to conduct. We eventually completed 149. Uh, the, the main shortfall, probably comes as no surprise, was, was with the prosecutors who proved to be the most difficult to, uh, to, to pin down from the, the, the Crown Prosecution Service that's separate to, to law enforcement. When we add in the additional eight that we undertook generally uh, to do with the confiscation order process, we, it, it created uh, 157 interviews. Um, now, now of the three uh, per, per case, we ended up with about 2.5 2 interviews per case. So it was, um, it was still, still pretty, a, a pretty good sample. The, uh, the, all, each interview on permission, and actually we got permission in, in almost every case, the interview was uh, recorded, digitally recorded, uh, and then subsequently transcribed verbatim. Uh, we ended up with a data set of 1.1 million words to, uh, to actually uh, then read through and analyze, which, uh, which took us a considerable period of time. So in terms of the, the sorts of cases that were included in those, those 60, uh, the numbers would add up to more than 60 because there could be more than one uh, crime involved in those. Um, there were two, two types of crime that particularly stood out. Um, uh, the financial investigation seems to be particularly effective at being used for drug supply and drug trafficking cases. Uh, and I'll come on to talk about why I think uh, that, that's particularly the, the case that the, the, and the circumstances in which it's particularly relevant. And money laundering. Um, now, in, the, in these cases, uh, the, the, the money laundering generally went with the, the drug trafficking. Uh, and the, those two tend to be tied together. Um, under Section 329 of the Proceeds of Crime Act, a person commits a money laundering offence if they acquire criminal property, use criminal property, or has possession of criminal property. And criminal property includes any benefit derived from criminal activity. Uh, essentially, it's uh, 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 unexplained wealth provision. If they, if they can um, show that this money couldn't have been um, created legitimately, then it could be used as a, in, a, in, a, in terms of money laundering case. And what we saw is that there were a significant number of cases where that's the way in which the financial investigation was being used for, at the prosecution stage of things. Uh, beyond those two, there was, there was actually a wide, uh, you see a wide, wide range of other sorts of criminality that were uh, were involved. Now, the approach that we took was to try and uh, unpack the stages of uh, investigation uh, and prosecution that, uh, asset, uh, that financial investigation uh, would be used. And we identified uh, these five stages of a, of a case. So first of all, we got, um, there were five, five of those 60 cases where the um, the financial investigation was used to identify an organized crime group in the first instance. There were 35 in which it was used at the pre-arrest stage uh, of a case in which they, it was in the, um, the stage of understanding the nature and extent of the criminality. Uh, in another 40, uh, well, in 40 cases, uh, it was also used in the uh, post-arrest stage of the, the investigation. Then in all 60, it was used in the prosecution and 58, it was used in the uh, confiscation order process. We were too short on the confiscation order process because of the West Midlands cases where they were, they was, they were at the prosecution, well, between prosecution and asset recovery at the point where we uh, undertook those interviews. So what I want to do is, is basically take us through each of those stages, but particularly focusing really on the first four. Um, in a sense, confiscation order process is the bit that's been done to death really in the research. And, the interesting bit is the earlier stages of how financial investigation is being used. And what I aim to do is try and unpack and show you um, the ways in which law enforcement in the UK are using financial investigation to, uh, particularly to understand the nature and extent of criminality. Okay, we start with uh, the use of financial investigation for identifying criminality in the first instance. 
And as I said, there are only five cases in our sample where uh, the, the case actually started from the, uh, from the financial investigation. And in uh, one of those, it was a case that was led by Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. Uh, and it was, in that case, it was intelligence that had been taken from an earlier operation, and then that was used to then drive another operation uh, uh, subsequently. So um, we say it was, uh, it was coming from the original financial investigation, but it was based on a, on a previous case. Now, obviously, Massachusetts Revenue and Customs, uh, the majority of their investigations are actually uh, financial investigations by, um, by default. And so you, you see that it makes sense that those are the ones where those come up. Um, in two cases, the, uh, the uh, intelligence was used to um, uh, basically develop uh, the case from an initial piece of intelligence. So in, in both cases, they were, there was a suspicious activity report from a bank uh, so, uh, where it kind of triggered um, over the uh, £10,000 limit, uh, and that then started off an investigation from, from there on in, in those two cases. Uh, actually, in both cases, that was um, local. Uh, it started off as, as local financial investigators working in a, in a local division and taking those forward and, uh, and without the thanks of their, their bosses, which I'll, I'll mention <coughs> in a moment. Um, there are also two cases in which uh, the, the, there had been an operation that had started to look at particular cases. And then the financial investigation really took the, the cases into a new direction and turned what was um, thought to be one kind of criminality into another. So in one case, uh, there, was a, there was an operation targeting a family that were, the intelligence had suggested, were involved in drug trafficking. Uh, when they eventually started doing some financial investigation work, they realized that actually the family were involved in a complex tax fraud associated with a payroll company. Uh, and it was uh, failing to declare the tax that the payroll company was uh, supposed to declare uh, that was where this, the, the family was were gaining their money from. In the other case, uh, the case started as a, uh, a tax credit uh, fraud case, again, by Hamashi's Revenue and Customs. And uh, as the, the, the case progressed, uh, the officers realized this wasn't about uh, tax fraud. It was actually a case of ghost brokering of insurance policies. So um, customers would, would contact these brokers for insurance, uh, for in, uh, act, uh, attacked as an insurance broker. The broker were basically giving insurance companies false details about the client and offering cheaper uh, insurance policies in return. Uh, and there was kind of a difference where they, they were keeping, the brokers were keeping um, the, 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 the difference so that um, basically, the, the insurers, were, the, the insured individuals, weren't covered because there's, there's a falsification given on the records. Now, what's interesting from talking to the financial investigators involved in these cases was that the, they were largely undertaken without the um, without the help of the crime managers or the, the su their supervisors, uh, and the supervisors are often keen to close these down on the basis that. Um, you're starting with, you're making up problems, we've got our own problems uh, with, without you finding more. You know, with, and so th these, these were typically um, uh, unpopular ways of using financial investigation. What we don't know is how many cases actually started in this way as, um, as identifying criminality that eventually led to no further action uh, because we're starting from a, a, a group of successful cases so all of these are followed through. So. There may be significant numbers of other cases that start off as intelligence leads from financial investigation that subsequently piece are out as, as, uh, as cases. Okay, we're going to move on to one thing that's a bit where it starts to get interesting, really, in terms of using financial investigation for uh, intelligence and case building. And here we want to look at both pre-arrest uh, pre and at the post-arrest stage. Um, now, there, there was, a, I guess, a difference between the two, where using financial intelligence at the pre-arrest stage uh, tended to be more covert, by definition, because you didn't want the uh, uh, individuals being targeted to be aware that the, uh, these kinds of uh, investigations were being undertaken against them. 
uh, at the post arrest stage, clearly you could be more overt uh, about the, the work that you were doing and actually undertake more open inquiries um, and, and so on. Um, so um, the, the issues around pre-arrest are also relevant to post arrest, but there is this difference between kind of covert versus overt uh, operation. Um, so I'm gonna, let's start with the um, case at the pre-arrest stage. Uh, we had 35 uh, cases where financial investigation uh, was used at that pre-arrest stage. Uh, and within those, uh, we've highlighted there, uh, but uh, we're going to start by looking at identifying the extent of an organized uh, crime network. And there were 28 cases in which financial investigation was used to identify the extent of a, a, of a, a crime network. And that could be used in two ways. It could either be used to, or, and or really, in terms of the geography uh, of the group uh, to understand uh, what was the, uh, the area in which the organized crime group were actually um, uh, active over, and also to identify the number of individuals involved, the extent of the organized crime group. So often you would you'd bring in additional individuals uh, as the, uh, the financial investigation continued, um, or actually could be used to close down the size of an, an investigation. So there was there was one case where the initial um, intelligence had identified something like 30 individuals involved in a, a drug trafficking case. And that was eventually reduced to about five core nominals that were actually the ones that were um, involved in the, in the criminality and the rest were really on the periphery. So it can be used in both ways to, to either uh, increase the scope of the investigation or to, to reduce the, the scale. I just want to talk about one particular case that, uh, that came to light, which uh, involved a uh, a cannabis, uh, the identif identification of a cannabis farm. And this was interesting because it actually started as the offender appearing as a victim. The, the, um, the assumed victim was a Vietnamese professional who had rented out a house and the house had subsequently been turned into a, uh, a cannabis farm. Uh, in the UK, um, Vietnamese pretty much cornered the market on cannabis farms, and this is kind of a typical MO that you, you'd uh, hire a, uh, a property for six months. Six month let was the, is the minimum let for a private uh, residential property. You'd pay up front for six months, so the, the owner of the property is happy. Uh, they've got their money for six months, uh, and they're kind of left to their own devices. In the meantime, they destroy the house, they turn it into a, uh, a can cannabis farm. Um, they strip out the electrics and install the, um, uh, the lighting and so on, and, and the house is pretty much ruined at the end of it. There had been a number of these where it had been actually Vietnamese owners that had this, um, uh, had this happen to them, and a team was set up to look, to look at these particular cases. And they began to look at the actual owners of the, uh, of the, the properties. And, uh, when they decided to in investigate this, this, partic this particular individual, they looked at the, um, the council tax um, forms that, that had been submitted and who was paying council tax on the property. And they found that it was the brother of the, the owner who was paying the council tax, which raised an issue. They then looked at the, the brother and they found that he actually owned a hydroponics company that was selling <laughs> hydroponics kits to uh, other would-be cannabis farmers. Um, so this obviously raised, raised suspicions, and as they, they looked into, into the case, they realized that actually what originally appeared to be the victim was actually uh, the, uh, the, the offender. It was a, a family-organized crime group that were, um, that were employing others to, to run these uh, cannabis uh, farms. Uh, the, they actually found that the, the, this particular uh, professional who owned the property had something like 17 bank accounts uh, operating across uh, the UK, Canada, and back into, into Vietnam. Um, and he was also running a uh, hawala um, operation as well in his local community uh, and um, sending money back to, to Vietnam. And so that became part of the operation as well. And effectively what, what he'd been doing was laundering money back to Vietnam by putting a bid on each, uh, each transaction he did uh, as an alternative remittance operation. Uh, he put a bid on each time and, and gradually shifted his capital back to, to Vietnam. 
Um, so that was a case where you know, it started off as one individual, actually ended up with uh, four individuals eventually involved in this particular case, which came from that initial financial investigation work that was, that was undertaken. Okay, we move on to looking at uh, locating assets. Um, obviously, that's a, a key area for financial investigation for the asset recovery side of things. Uh, but it's also useful sh for showing the, the wealth generated by particular uh, organized crime groups. So, I mean, typically there, they'd be looking at the bank accounts, property, uh, vehicles that they may own, uh, shares in businesses, uh, valuables in uh, safe deposit uh, boxes, uh, etc. Uh, and one of the, the recurring issues that came up uh, in uh, relation to uh, locating assets was uh, overseas inquiries. Um, uh, time and time again, financial investigators uh, explained how they never really got to the bottom of where the assets had gone because there was uh, there's always uh, uh, a, a push to wrap cases up and to to complete cases within a certain period of time. And often they wouldn't actually get the, um, the inquiries back from, from uh, foreign jurisdictions in time for cases. And there was often um, questions about, um, well, we never really discovered where uh, their assets were, but we think they had assets typically in southern Spain, which is a popular spot for organized crime groups in the UK. Um, but th that's a real issue that I think still continues, is, is how do you um, uh, expedite those overseas inquiries um, quickly so that you can actually you know, complete cases. And I guess some of these um, organized crime groups knew this as well, so there are certain uh, jurisdictions that, that came up time and time again as, as places where if you sent money, pretty much you were never going to get a response from them. Uh, and you, you probably guess where they, those countries were. Okay, next moving on to uh, identifying uh, ownership and use of, of property. Uh, and often, obviously this is often used to identify the value of the criminal assets that's subsequently used to uh, assess the, uh, the benefit figure from, from the criminality. Uh, but it can also be used to support uh, live operations as well. Uh, as, I'll just show you a couple of uh, examples. So the first case uh, was uh, a case of a, an organized crime group using a uh, particular safe house that the, uh, l the law enforcement agency looking at that particular group were completely unaware that the organized crime group had this particular safe house, which was in a, uh, a luxury apartment in a, in a nice part of a, uh, a particular city in, uh, in England. And it was only through the analysis of the, the bank records that it came to light that the, there were payments going to a rental agent and subsequent uh, inquiries with that rental agent identified that there was a property that was being let by the, uh, this particular group. So there's an example where uh, identifying the, the uh, property the, and, and assets was, was a way of uh, actually getting to understand a, uh, more about a live operation. Second example was uh, a case of a uh, particular, particular law enforcement agency in one part of the country that were uh, uh, undertaking a surveillance operation on uh, a group that, that took them to, a, to another city, a city that they didn't know particularly well, and uh, they saw the group go to a particular property. Uh, and at that point, they kind of lost the, the trail. They were unaware who this property was. And it was subsequently through analysis of uh, housing benefit records that uh, were, um, were on uh, that particular property. They identified an individual that was connected with the, the organized crime group that then drew uh, in that, uh, that individual into the op uh, operation as well. So again, using um, financial investigation, looking at uh, housing benefit records, widened the, um, the, the, the scope of the, the, the operation and understanding you know, who was involved in particular properties. Next, uh, uncovering uh, lifestyle, and I guess um, th th that's an important part when it comes to, to prosecutions, to be able to, uh, I guess, juxtapose the uh, lifestyle that individuals were leading against the legitimate earnings that they were getting, you know, typically from claiming um, unemployment benefit, because 
uh, often the, uh, the two would, would go together as, uh, in, in terms of these groups, they'd still be claiming benefits uh, while reaping huge rewards from criminal activity. Uh, and, uh, and also recognizing that a lot of the, lot of the benefit was um, in a conspicuous lifestyle. So it wasn't that they were necessarily, um, necessarily accumulating many assets, but often it would be used for, uh, for, for uh, just, just a lifestyle of uh, holidays and renting properties, hiring cars and so on, that, and ways in which they can have a lifestyle without necessarily uh, having the assets that can be taken off them. Now, interestingly, financial investigation was used in eight cases to track movements of individuals as well. And uh, so, for example, you can, uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in a reactive way, gather information about uh, ATMs used, shops visited, restaurants used, and used to build up a kind of lifestyle profile of, of what individuals uh, tend to do. Uh, which is cheaper to, than um, using a surveillance team to gather some of that information. Um, and that's the, one, of the, one of the key benefits of this kind of approach. And there was one case where uh, the financial investigator uh, knew that the, uh, a, a particular individual always took his kids to McDonald's at uh, five, about five o'clock on a, on a Friday uh, at the start, start of a weekend. Uh, a surveillance team had been following the individual. They'd lost, lost the individual during the day. They'd contacted the financial investigator who said, ah, I know where he's going to be at 5 o'clock. He'll be in Mac this particular McDonald's. And lo and behold, that they, that's where they picked him up again. So a case of where they used you know, that, that knowledge of that lifestyle to, to, uh, for, for the uh, uses of surveillance. One more example was the, the case of uh, East Coast Mainline uh, Drugs Network. And this was a, uh, here we got, you, know, you can't really see the, the picture of the uh, UK, but there's a, the, basically that's the train line between uh, London King's Cross uh, up to uh, Edinburgh and beyond, which is the, the main uh, uh, East Coast train line. Um, in this particular operation, there was a, uh, an organized crime group that had been identified as using the, the train network to distribute uh, drugs uh, up and down the country. Uh, but the surveillance team didn't have a starting point to, to know where, which station the, uh, the gang were particularly using uh, for, for this, uh, in this um, drug dealing operation. So uh, some initial financial investigation identified from the bank statements that uh, there was uh, train tickets that had been purchased from a particular uh, train operating company. There are about 30 train operating companies in the UK, all selling tickets for everyone else. So they contacted the particular company, uh, and which identified the station at which those tickets had been purchased. Uh, they were then able to um, pick up the, the team for surveillance by targeting that particular station. So it was a way of, of um, getting, getting a start, basically, on a, on a live operation. Okay, and finally, on the pre-arrest stage, uh, placing people at particular places at particular times. Uh, and this was, this was relatively rare. There, there were three cases in which we identified uh, this occurring. Um, so typically, you would have uh, financial investigation, financial intelligence being used in conjunction with other surveillance sources. So, for, for example, using CCTV to, to marry up uh, where financial transactions are, are taking place. Let's give you a couple of examples of, of where uh, financial investigation was used in that way. So first of all, the, the case of the mobile phone top-up. Uh, in the UK, uh, mobile phones can be quite anonymous. You can buy a, a mobile phone in a supermarket for about £20. Uh, you can then uh, load credit onto that phone by buying uh, a voucher that has kind of a scratch-off number that code that you put into the phone, and then you've got uh, credit on your phone. So uh, in this particular case, uh, they, they knew an individual, uh, or they, uh, they knew an organized crime group was using a particular phone. They could see that numbers, that calls were being made to a particular number. They didn't know who that individual was, who, who those calls were being made to as a result of the phone, phone analysis. Uh, the, 
uh, as a result of contacting the uh, mobile phone company with the phone number, they identified uh, the, a, a particular voucher that it, the phone had been topped up with credit with. They then identified which store the, uh, the voucher had been purchased from through the, uh, through the mobile phone company in terms of where those uh, vouchers had been distributed. They then went to that, that particular store and they used uh, their, the, reviewed the CCTV footage for the particular day when the, the, uh, the phone was topped up uh, to then identify the individual that had uh, purchased that particular voucher. So it's a way of kind of working back from initial financial investigation through to use of CCTV. And secondly, a, a similar case of um, a, identifying who's making a bank payment. So in this case, uh, there was a, a known drug trafficker in one part of the country uh, who was receiving money being paid into an account in uh, uh, pretty much the opposite extreme end of the, end of the country. Uh, and as a result of reviewing the uh, CCTV in that bank uh, from where the money had been paid in, they identified the individual that was uh, actually paying the money in and so therefore again extended the, the size of the network, the knowledge of the, the network involved. So those are the cases at the, uh, the, the pre-arrest stage. Uh, and I'll just talk briefly about the post-arrest. On the basis that most of those techniques could also be used uh, post-arrest anyway. But where it began to be more overt was that the financial investigators would be used to serve restraining orders on the, the, uh, the assets that, that could be uh, restrained, uh, particularly uh, on uh, cars and, and, and uh, houses on property. Uh, and also the financial investigators played a real role in assisting with searches of properties. Uh, because they would know what was valuable and what wasn't from a, a financial investigation, uh, it saved time for officers to basically not have to take everything that they could say, no, that's useful, and I need, you know, that's a, uh, that bank statement's useful, that's not. So that they were useful to take along on, um, on those searches. Okay, I'm going to move on to uh, talking about the, the role of financial investigation at the uh, prosecution stage. Now, what we found was that financial investigation uh, supported a prosecution in 30 of the 60 cases. And this, this, is a, this was a, a, a part of the research where we took quite a conservative approach where we said, okay, we actually need to have two of the three uh, individuals we've interviewed to confirm that it was actually beneficial for the prosecution. So that we'd need either a you know, financial investigator and an and a, uh, investigating officer and or a uh, prosecutor to uh, to, to, show, to, to prove that the, the case was actually beneficial for prosecution. So 30 out of the 60 cases, it was beneficial. In uh, 12 of those cases, the, there would have been no conviction without financial investigation, uh, which I, those to me I think particularly interesting because that really just showed show, show the benefit, I think, and I'll come back to those in a second. There were 14 cases where financial investigation uh, identified the nature of the uh, offender's uh, role in a case. Um, and those were typically the cases where uh, th those kind of uh, drug dealing, uh, organized crime groups where individuals would say, oh, you know, it, I was just on the periphery, I just was being dragged into it and I just happened to be in, the, uh, in, the, you know, in, in a particular house on the day of a raid and got dragged in, you know, it was nothing to do with me. And so therefore they used the financial investigation to actually identify that individuals were linked with um, the particular operation. In five cases, financial investigation identified others uh, involved uh, in the case, so, so it actually uh, extended the, the number of individuals that were brought in. And in seven cases, financial investigation identified other offences in addition to the uh, substantive offences. So that's where particularly we're looking at the, uh, the money laundering offences coming in, into play. So I just want to go back to those 12 cases where uh, there would have been no conviction without the, the financial investigation. And it's just a, uh, so some details of, of those, those cases. Um, this is actually from a, another paper that I'll be publishing in uh, the Journal of Financial Crime in September. Um, 
And a key thing to, to highlight here is actually, uh, in these cases, financial investigation tended to come in quite early in the cases. So if you look, it's mostly at the, uh, the, the pre-arrest stage or at the point of identifying criminality, so quite early on. But even in those, when we delved a bit deeper, we identified that uh, often that pre-arrest stage could go on for two years before they decide to get the financial investigators involved, uh, almost as a last ditch. Well, we might as well try that kind of uh, approach. Uh, and you can see the range of, of, of types of um, uh, cr cr criminality that they were initially, you can't really see it, the third column is the, the, the criminality that they were initially targeting, and then the final column is what they eventually got a prosecution for. And what's interesting is that the cases they got prosecutions for were, uh, were all kind of financial crime type cases. Um, there were four where, and there are only four there you can see where the uh, the convicted criminality uh, was what they started with. So there's one case of money laundering, one of VAT fraud, one of advanced fee fraud, and one of fraud and, and money laundering. If we take those out, uh, here, here's what, what we're left with of the cases, basically the uh, eight cases where there was a difference between what they started to investigate and what they eventually ended up in investigating. Um, and to be fair, it was largely as a, um, as a fallback position so, for example, they couldn't get somebody for drug supply or um, arms trafficking, but they could get them on the, uh, the financial investigation cases, particularly the money laundering cases where uh, they showed you know, significant assets that couldn't be explained by the legitimate earnings. Okay, just drawing us towards the end uh, of that process, uh, just briefly uh, touch on the um, the role of financial investigation in the confiscation order process. And obviously that's the bit that's most well understood. But even there, there were issues that, that kept coming up. Um, one was about what we called horse trading at the, the court doors. So you would uh, have um, individuals saying, well, I'll, um, I'll agree to a benefit figure of um, 100,000 when the financial investigators have a figure of a million uh, on the basis that, well, we're more likely to get the 100,000 past the judge. And so there's that kind of uh, uh, horse train that goes on. And actually, in, there, were, there were cases where they, they were saying that uh, <coughs> judges were basically turned to go out and just agree among yourselves what the figure's going to be and then come back and we'll, we'll then uh, agree on the figure. So, so there was, there was a, 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 certainly a, a degree, for, degree of nego negotiation going on. And I think that will get stronger in, in, uh, in future, actually. Um, there were delay tactics that were pl uh, played to reduce realizable assets. So um, there was, a judge would typically allow for um, a certain amount of the uh, assets that had been um, frozen to be used for living expenses. So the longer that you could stretch out a case, uh, the, the more you could uh, actually spend those assets. So it was, in, it was actually in your um, favor, in your benefit to to stretch out the, the process of agreeing a, the, uh, the benefit figure for as long as possible. And you, you would have a process of uh, uh, offenders typically changing their, their briefs, their, um, their solicitors on a regular basis, and so sister having to start again with the case and going back to court and saying, I need longer to, uh, to get to grips with this case, and, and, and continuing that process of, of allowing the offenders to, to spend the, the, uh, the frozen assets. There's also a question that we had at the end of the, the research that really wasn't answered. Um, we assume that confiscation makes a difference. There's no evidence in the, any of the literature to suggest it does. Um, so, I, it's not to say it doesn't, we just don't know. Um, so does uh, confiscation actually disrupt organised criminality in addition to the custodial sentence that's, that's received? Part of the problem we had with our research was that the that, uh, a co that a custodial sentence would be placed on the individuals um, as well as having to repay the assets at the same time. So the law enforcement uh, uh, agencies that we spoke to couldn't really tell you whether it made a difference in terms of the asset recovery because these people were generally um, in prison at the time uh, serving a sentence. So I mean, in a sense, the jury's still out as to what, would ha what happens subsequently. And there, there's some talk about, well, uh, Organised crime groups operating from prisons, uh, for one, and continuing in business. 
And there's also talk about the need to actually recoup your assets um, in a more lively fashion. So you may actually be busier when you, uh, when you come out of jail and, and start again. Um, so it's, it's been an unknown as to how much it disrupts uh, in, the, in the long term. And so I'd be interested in views on that. Just a few of the, the, the problems that we identified in terms of financial investigation. As I've already mentioned, the, the overseas investigations were uh, a particular uh, issue and, and continue to be, I believe. Um, there, was, there were issues around the time taken by banks to produce the, uh, the, uh, the accounts of the individuals that they're, they're looking at. Um, the, the, this uh, research obviously followed on from the um, global financial crisis. Uh, banks actually went into a process of reducing their staffing which meant that there were fewer staff doing this kind of role, which meant that it took them longer to produce the, the materials for, uh, for law enforcement agencies, and actually were getting um, firmer about how much information they would give out and, um, and how timely that would be too. Um, there's also issues around um, concealing uh, assets as well, that um, a, a perennial problem of you know, putting the names of, of properties, uh, it, uh, putting yeah, names of properties in to your friends and family so that uh, you may not uh, directly identify that that asset is linked to, to uh, any particular individual. Um, problems with the uh, asset recovery uh, process that came out from the interviews and then subsequently with the, the eight that we undertook with uh, the enforcement teams. Um, restraining assets uh, is an issue in that there's no central database of of who's got a restraining uh, order on them. So uh, somebody can have their, their assets frozen with one bank and could actually go to a competitive bank and open a bank account and continue trading. They've, obviously their assets have been frozen, but they can continue trading through another bank. Um, problems locating offenders, uh, often subsequently too, if, you've, if individuals got short prison sentences, there may be difficulties actually tracking down those individuals to take their assets. Um, Third-party claims on assets was a, was a perennial um, concern um, from, two, um, from two places, really. One was uh, uh, particularly ex-wives who said, actually, that's mine, that's, that's, uh, those assets belong to me, or business partners, uh, particularly in uh, the people involved, would be involved in you know, all kinds of um, small-scale business operations, and the business partners would say, well, actually, that's mine, uh, rather than the, uh, the individuals. Um, also, there's a high cost of recovery. That enforcement process can be expensive, especially if you need to use specialist um, recovery organisations, financial recovery organisations. Uh, and lastly, there was a lack of follow-up of nominal orders. So if you identified that uh, an individual uh, may have had uh, an assessed benefit figure of a million pounds, say, uh, yet their assets only amounted to a thousand pounds that you could take off them, they, they would be given an award of a thousand pounds on that, uh, on the um, realizable asset side of things. So they would have to repay a thousand pounds, or it could be even less. It could be a hundred pounds. It could be one pound. Um, but the fact is that the original assessed benefit figure remains. So they still owe the state a million pounds, and it remains with them for life until they've repaid. And up until recently. Uh, law enforcement agencies haven't been going back and revisiting those cases, and they're just starting to do that now. So you think the legislation has been running for about 10 years. Uh, people have had an opportunity to have um, been caught, served a sentence, paid a nominal sum, and rebuilt their assets up again. And now law enforcement agencies are starting to think about and starting to revisit those cases and say, well, actually, you still owe the, uh, the state best part of a, of a million pounds, what have you got now for us to take off you? And they're beginning to take assets off a second time. And, it, and, uh, and this is the point where I think what we're beginning to see in future is that in prosecutions, uh, in terms of ag agreeing uh, the, uh, the, uh, the benefit figure from the criminality, uh, the organized uh, crime groups will, will actually get, uh, will actually haggle that much more and they'll be try much harder to, to, to reduce that benefit figure because they know that in future law enforcement agencies may come back and ask them again for, for, uh, for assets from them. So I think it's a you know, continued changing landscape. 
So, just conclude, uh, financial investigation is increasingly being mainstreamed as an investigative process in England and Wales. Uh, it seems to work best in collaboration with uh, traditional forms of investigation. So it doesn't tend to be used on its own. It's used in conjunction with surveillance teams, with traditional other methods of, of investigation. And it can have a significant impact on success of, of prosecutions, as, as we've seen, and in some cases there would be no success without the, uh, the financial investigation. And uh, finally, financial investigation uh, of uh, benefit beyond its um, sorry, financial investigation has, has benefit beyond its role in asset recovery. So it's not just about recovering the assets, it's about the investigation and prosecution as well. Okay, just finally, uh, just a, a plug. The, this is the, the report that uh, came out in September. Uh, it's available on the, the, the Home Office uh, website, but if anybody wants to drop me an email, I can, I can send you an electronic copy too. Thank you very much.